Okay, so let's begin. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us here again today. So it's our fourth webinar series uh, in our mini weekly webinar series. So and today it's a bit different because I won't be the one speaking. So we have Chitra Sharma here today. She has done her PhD from Aizar Thiruvananthapuram, and now she is a postdoc in Germany. So she'll talk all about her experiences as well as how she um, navigated her transition from PhD to postdoc with respect to Germany. So let's, without further delay, I'll just hand over Chitra and she can take it forward from here. Welcome, Chitra, and the stage is all yours. Thanks a lot, Payal, for the introduction and also for inviting me to do this. And it has always felt great to be here and uh, present something about me or, you know, about my experiences. So thanks a lot. So we'll start. Okay. Can you all see this? Everything fine? Yes, we can see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You can go okay. to the full screen so, mode. This is full screen oh, mode. Okay, yeah, sure. Is it not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. So okay, so today I'll be talking about postdoc applications in abroad. I mean, some of things that I would say would be general, like you can apply to everywhere. And but I am an experimental physicist and I work in Germany, so a lot of details would also be focused on Germany. But then I mean, we'll see. Uh, so as Payal mentioned already, so I did my bachelor's like BSMS and PhD from Isar Thiruvananthapur. I worked in the field of quantum transport, which is a field of experimental condensed matter physics. And then from there, I joined University of Hamburg in 2019 as a postdoc. So I already had applied for Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. And when I received it, I was a Humboldt Fellow for two years. And now I'm also associated with the uh, Christian Albrecht University to Kiel. So, uh, so I'm continuing my work in Hamburg as well as Kiel. So this came as a collaboration. So if you have any questions, you can uh, also, you know, ask me later in my LinkedIn or Twitter or things like that. And I'm mostly interested in academia and especially research and teaching. My career path or the postdocs that I chose were because, you know, this was my interest. So before going into the talk, I want to tell you that everything I'm talking here is based on my personal experience. And don't generalize my opinions because uh, these uh, the topic that we are discussing is very, you know, subjective. So it can depend on, you know, your field, where you're coming from, where you want to go, what time you want to go, and and a lot of lot of things. Yeah. So these are uh, everybody have a different experience. I'm just trying to share what I feel about it, and you cannot generalize everything. And if you choose to decide a postdoc, or if you choose to decide a postdoc at any place, it should be your own decision. It should, or even if you don't, if you choose not to do a post, it should be also your own decision because this has happened before that, you know, you give someone some opinion and then they say, okay, everything is because me. I will not take it. So, and uh, here I would like to discuss and share. This would be better that way rather than I just, you know, giving me um, like one directional um, uh, opinions. So basically, you can ask me questions if you have. Uh, there are options to raise hand and so on. So let us know. Maybe Pyle, you can let me know or interrupt me if there is something in the chat or so. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay, and uh, let me begin with the types of postdocs or uh, what you want to want to choose. So th there are, like you can you can have many career paths after your PhD. So you can choose to continue in research, you can just go and work, or if you you if you want to stay research and want to do a postdoc, it could be 
uh, based on an industry postdoc or it could be like an university postdoc uh, or something combined or it could be in a research institute so if you are mostly into industry that you you know you want to do a research based industry and you want to do a job there it's pretty good to look for postdocs in the industry that will be a better opportunity to get a good job on the other hand if you are purely focusing on academia where you are also interested in teaching and interacting with students and all kinds of things like that then university is actually a better choice i mean it's not that you know they are if you choose university you will not get a job in industry and so on you can always you know move but what i'm saying is it it's a bit easier to uh, to go for industrial jobs if you already are doing an industrial postdoc so that that's what i meant and in germany you have different uh, research institutes or and universities so universities are mainly not just for research they are all for teaching so if you have teaching interest and you can guide students like master bachelor students you can train them you can also involve in something on the other hand research institutes are mostly focused on research but the thing is the research institutes will have of course a lot of fun and they will they will not have lot of teaching duties so your time will be uh, you know well spent mostly in research so you choose whichever one you like and actually i took this picture from this website where they had listed a lot of details about picking a postdoc and it would be interesting for you so you can you can check this if if interested and so what is basically a postdoc actually i have to thank phd comics that i took a lot of pictures from them why this presentation would look uh, full of words so i i took some interesting pictures or comics related to postdoc so what what is expected from a postdoc especially in academia is that you're expected to do some in, independent research and you're expected to bring some expertise to the group that you know they don't yet have it or they don't have it established but they want to have a new expertise brought into the group uh, you would be expected to work as a team and to guide other students like master bachelor students or even phd students and you would also be expected to write research papers or even reports so postdoc is actually not the best phase in your academic life uh, or your research life because you know you, you are not given that much attention like a phd student from your mentors always the students will get most of the attention because they have to finish their they have a time limit they have to finish their thesis and so on on the other hand postdocs are expected to produce results and you you will be you know trying to find another job and so on so this is like an in between period in your life and okay so and what you would have to expect from uh you know your host or your university or your group when you want to do a postdoc is the independence for doing your research so you will you should be able to choose a problem or um you know come up have some freedom in doing your research but this depends on the group to want to join or on the project that you want to join sometimes you you will be taken as a postdoc for an existing proposal has a specific goal then you would be asked to work on that problem or to achieve that specific goal or sometimes and you can write your own proposal i will talk about it later then actually you can talk to your host or, or guide provider and then come up with a problem together and in that case you would have a bit more freedom to do what you want to do so this is something is very um, related to where you want to join and what kind of uh, project you are assigned to and so on and the productivity as a postdoc as i mentioned you you will have some more independence and you are already having a lot of expertise in the field and you should also you know try to improve your skills like you you should uh, you know choose a group where you can learn something new not just what you have been continue what you have been doing so this will be like mutually helpful 
on the other hand you will be expected to also perform dependently and so on so this sometimes will be uh, you know difficult to be that productive because you're expected to know everything and then work uh, independently and produce easily results but you know this depends a lot on the space time coordinate where you are in the group and how how they work what kind of team you have and so on so it's it's actually very good to already do some research on where you want to go like you know, how active is the PI on the research field? Are they publishing regularly if they have, if they are, you know, doing active research in the field you want to do? And this will also tell you that, okay, they have enough knowledge or they are also, uh, you know, have publications that you can also get publication, which is something that you would be aiming for as a postdoc. And what you could do is to talk to the group members and also get feedbacks from them about the group the work culture and everything and uh, join the group if you you know get a good vibe so because this is very important when you do research to have a good environment that you you know feel comfortable and you should be able to like what you're doing because of course this is few years of your life and i always tell it's very important for a phd student to have a good group to have a good advisor, it's it's actually same for poster. And uh, when you when you actually try to do this postdoc, you would be usually contacted by the supervisor. You would have a one one interaction with them, and try to communicate them uh, with them and tell them what your opinions are, and you know talk to them open and how how well you can communicate with each other. So this is also something that you can look for if you feel. You know, that is not going pretty well. It's better to look for some other place. OK, so what is the pro and con of a uh, postdoc abroad? Actually, I'm aiming at an audience who are mostly Indian. So, uh, but this would also be applicable to anybody who are coming from another country to going to a new place. So let's see what it could be. So. The pros are, of course, you get a lot of international exposure, also in terms of research atmosphere. So this, uh, the the lab culture or the research culture in different countries is very different. So this is something that you can experience, and you would start to work with a more international community, and you know, you, you get to learn from them and uh, how people take uh, different things. For example, even writing a paper what kind of things that they take seriously or you know how much importance has to be given to certain things or how much details they they are taking care of and so on so there are a lot of things that uh, international exposure can give you and of course uh, in developed countries you get much higher salary hello is there a question okay uh, so I'll continue. Uh, so uh, of course you get much higher salary, actually in countries like Germany and in US and so on. But you also have to think that you have like a high expenditure compared to India or any developing country. Uh, but compared to your salary or proportional to salary, you, you will be able to save a, a much higher amount. And you will have a lot of independence in terms of uh, research and also in terms of your personal life because this uh, these are much more uh, countries that are much free and you can actually travel safe it's it's easy to go around it's it's a very safe place and um the developed countries usually give very much importance especially germany to work life balance so here you should be people who do not work in the weekends or you know after 5 pm they're already home and uh, you have a fixed work hours you work during your work hours and you go home and you um, have your own life other than work so this is very normal here and uh, as i mentioned already it's a very safe place so um, you don't have a lot of issues that you know you can travel anytime it's 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 a very safe place also in terms of work uh you you have a lot of 
um, like you know social security and so on so even if you have to uh, lose your job for a few few months you will already get paid and and you can live in country and so on and or also one more thing is you get to meet or you get to see a lot of different culture you also get to see many places so this is also one of the pro and the cons if you want to look at of course if you go from one kind of culture to another you will have a cultural shock also in terms of the academic culture and your job will be always tied up with your visa or visa will be tied up with your job so this is something that would be um really tense situation could come for example if you uh, if you are switching your jobs from one place to the other uh, so then you have to you know, obtain a visa you have to get appointments so these kind of bureaucracy is a bit uh, time taking and you don't have to have this if you're living in your own country and another thing is you will miss your friends and family so this is some other thing that you know you uh, have to uh, this these are all like personal things some of them some of the pros that i listed here might cons for you some of the cons might be pros for you but still uh, you know uh, i'm based on my personal preferences experiences and so on and also after talking to many people i listed it like this uh, so of course you you miss your friends and family and there is a chance that your productivity will go less of course i talked about work life balance that also means that your fellows or your colleagues may not be available when you want them um so especially even if you do your work you work you want to work a lot when you work as a team everything is a team effort in research mostly especially in experimental work it's not just that you do your thing when the team itself is a bit slower of course you will be slow down too so you will to a, another pace where if if you want to like work very vigorously and too much that may not be that possible and climate and weather this is a very cold country germany especially in most of uh, europe are uh, cold countries and also a lot of regions in us and so on and what also what happens is if you are in a higher latitude uh, the the weather would be so different especially i was talking to pile about it a bit earlier the winter will be very dark and very cold and the darkness actually might affect you because this is very important for our normal body process and so on so this can take you to a low mood and you know you have to cope up with it so this is also something that some people might like it some people might not again it's it's very dependent on on person but in general the weather is very different the the climate is different the the sunlight is different and so on and another thing especially in european countries is you will language barrier of course germany is a place where people are used to talk to in german with each other from their childhood so when they see each, they also study in germany so english is not their first language and they'll be very comfortable to talk to each other in german we can't complain about it but this also means that of course in academic setting especially in science it's okay people talk in english every most english but at some point some internal information or if you want to talk to for example a, a technician they may not be able to speak english so there will be a language barrier that you will have to overcome so either you will have to learn um, german or you know you have to somehow come up with or make in terms with it okay maybe there are there are more pros and cons that i forgot but i have tried to include whatever came to my mind and next now we can look at how to find positions or how to find postdoc positions excuse me so um usually open positions are advertised in the website of universities or the websites of the particular research groups so this depends on if they get a funding for a proposal there will be an opening open position and would uh, you know up 
uh, an ad based on that. But usually, uh, this may not be the case. Usually, they would already have someone who, who they know or who already contacted you. So I would you know, or really recommend that you send email people who are interesting to you and just ask them. And there are also websites I forgot to mention. So there are also websites that alert you when uh, you know you you want a position or uh, you're looking for something. For example, Nature Careers is one website where uh, you can look for these postdoc positions or even other kind of jobs. They would uh, list out the jobs and and you can uh, know them. You just have to simply ask Google. They would. You know, they they I think Google also has a like career um, website that that can give you alerts and can you can see all the openings, not all openings, but whatever is listed in their you know website. Uh, but as I mentioned already, if you have an interesting group, don't wait for an advertisement to come up. Um, just send an email and you know try to contact them and try to make a connection with them. Uh, usually when you send an email, you may not get a response, but we will come to, or I will discuss about how to send an email and what it will look like and so on. And also it's important that you can discuss with your PhD supervisor and ask for opinions. They might know people or, you know, of course this is a common field and they will all have connections. So you could, talk to your PhD supervisor, maybe they know some people, so then you can email them. And that's something that would work out a bit more easier, writing emails to people who don't know at all. And very important thing is networking. And this is usually done through conferences. So you go to conferences, you ask, uh, you know, you talk to people a bit informally during breaks and so on. And if you are like close to finishing your PhD, or if you are looking for a postdoctoral position, you can, you know, tell them about it. You can give them your CV if you have uh, one in hand. That would be nice. So they will actually remember you. And when you send an email, you can indicate this. So I had talked to you um, in this conference, and and so on and so forth. So this would be a good thing to have a networking that will already, you know, um, get you a bit known to the person kind of so then uh, a familiarity can be a good thing when you want to send email or at least to get a response and now uh, when you try to send emails these professors are usually very busy with a lot of things they don't spend a lot of time to read everything in the email so if you you can find their email ID from the website and write email. And also try to make sure that you get the right email address. And so that because people sometimes might move from one university to, uh, to the other. So make sure that they are at this at the time you want to apply, they are at the right place or they are at the place that you are looking at, and so on. And always try to send email without too much details or too long emails. I will come to it again. So like mentioned in this uh, comic, so if you try to send a long email to your uh, your professor, maybe he will just read the first two words. And then he will decide based on this, but you might be saying something completely opposite. So this is very important. Write emails in a proper way that that will you know, get you some reply, or at least they will read it and so on. And uh, while sending emails, do send, and of course, uh, there was a um, webinar by like a month ago. Hello. Excuse me. Is there a question? Go on. Uh, okay, hope not. Yeah, yeah, go on. Okay. All right. So there, there was like a talk uh, or a webinar by Pyle like a month ago about how to write emails in general. So you could also go check it out and see uh, more pointers about specifically about writing emails. 
but I mean, I would give some details, especially related to the postdoc applications. I can check this out for, for more details. So um, what to do and what not to do while sending emails for postdoc applications. Number one is keep it short and simple. As I mentioned already, uh, professors don't need to read. You know, they get so many emails every day and they may not be able to see everything. They they don't want to read too much. You know, if if you if you start sending a many page email, they already don't want to read it and this is a red flag. So don't do it. And attach a CV. This is very important. So if you just send email with some words, nobody will take you seriously. So pair a good CV and attach your CV with the email. And I, I think there's also a webinar about how to write a resume C. So you could also check it out in the YouTube channel of PhDs of India. And you should mention your research interests and expertise and what got you attracted to the group. So this is also something that is very important to be specified. Otherwise, people would think that you're randomly sending emails. So um, have some short description about what you're interested in and what got you interested in the group. And it's very important to be very genuine when you make such discussions. Or in general, I think in science, genuinity is very important. So this is um, something that people would look for. And as an extra, uh, what you could you could say is what you could possibly contribute to the group. You know, for example, if you find a project that aligns with your interest, you can say that you know I have expertise. This I saw this project that you're doing is something very interesting to me, and so on. So this is the plus when you could write the email. And also, if there is any funding option that you can apply for. Um, then you could also mention this. So usually, um, not everybody will have an open position. This is just for this to happen. That at the time of you sending these emails, they will have an open position and so on. This is not very easy to happen. So usually, uh, you know, they might reply to you if you say that, yeah, I'm interested in such and such funding as possible, and I would be interested to apply for them. So then it's not like you know they will reply to you only if they have a position, but they would reply to you if they still have space in the group, or they can afford, or they can, uh, you know, spend, uh, or they can have a, a postdoc in the group. So this means you're coming with your own funding, so that would be an advantage. And don't, as I already mentioned, please do not send very long emails. And also do not send a general email to, or you know, send the same email to many people. Always be specific about what your interests are and, and why you are applying to, to this group and so on. Otherwise, if nobody will not care about, about your email. So it's like, it, some people already you know send email without changing the name of the professor so this copy paste thing is not a good thing and please do not over praise or over boost yourself so this of course means that you're not that genuine and uh, then it's a red flag and as already mentioned while you know sending same email to many people do not copy the wrong name or detail or create typos etc this would also be red flags and people will not consider you seriously uh, i think i copied the same thing again so this is also something wrong and do not spam um spam the the professors or pis with many emails once you send an email please wait for some time and you could send a reminder to them that you are serious. You're not just sending randomly or serious about it. But do not send a reminder you know, every day morning or something like that. You could send a reminder maybe after 10 to 15 days. And if you still did not get a reply, then please stop sending them emails. 
so what i did when i had to apply for postdoc position was i created a spreadsheet with a list of interesting groups for me and i listed their research interest and i wrote down what is good for me and what is not good for me like pros and cons from my side to to weigh uh, what would be good and what not and i chose a few according to uh, the preference and i prepared draft emails for each of them and i sent it to send it to them and usually i did not send at the same day to many groups of course you can send to many pis um at the same time because you cannot wait for many days to get a reply it's, it's usually that you don't get a reply from many people if they don't have a position or if they cannot have a, a one more postdoc in their group or maybe they don't have space in their group and for many reasons usually some people doesn't say no so they just ignore you or it you know they have too many emails that it, they missed your email so for many reasons you may not get a reply uh, but it's not possible to wait after you get a reply and ha have a no and then send an email to other people so it's okay to send um, the same time ask many people at the same time but once you start discussing with them then is what you have to be careful so you to openly tell other people that you have been discussing with already a group and uh, you know you, you be open and you be so this is very important so what i wanted to say that i prepare draft emails and send them and i prepare this for a for each group separately or for each pi separately not that i i had one email and i sent it to them at the same day to each people so each so what i made sure is that i send only one email per day so then i also will not get confused so one example email that from me except that i i removed the professor's name and their details but what i did was address them with their usually with their last name and you can call them professor x not x you know what what their actual last name is and then introduce i introduced myself like very briefly and i told about what my interests are and what is overlapping with their group for example i talked about one paper that came recently which was related to what i did and then i said i'm interested to apply for a postdoctoral position and also in a fellowship and so on and then i listed about my experience and i attached my cv as well so here i actually did not tell the experience first because i have to give them a contest of who i am and i also told them about the fellowship and, and work first and then only i went into the experience because they can always see this in my cv okay and yeah so uh what to do after receiving a reply so usually uh, don't expect reply from everyone not everyone will give you a reply as i already mentioned and if they are interested in the profile they would not tell you yes immediately they would ask you for an interview so um usually what people do is especially if they get an application from another country uh, for example in my group i am only indian as a postdoc so if if we have an application from from india and then they see that the profile is good they usually ask me about how uh, how the institute is and how the cv is and so on because of course they may not be able to judge it so it's very um very different for different places different universities and so on so they usually discuss with other people they might know for example if they know your phd supervisor they might talk to you talk to them or if they know someone in common they might ask them or or like if someone is there in their group in their group who are related to their country or who are from the same institute and so on they discuss with them and then they would send you a reply 
and usually would ask you to meet um, in an interview. And then once they, you receive an email from them, you, you should basically try to reply. You know, don't wait for one week to send a reply. So this is also important that you keep checking your email. And don't complain just about the professors because this is your need. So please check your emails and then reply and organize meetings with them based on a convenient time for both of you. And if you don't get any response or if someone says that, I'm sorry, we don't have a position, please accept it and don't try to force them or you know uh, spam their email. Uh, of course, this I, I want to specifically say this is at the time, you may not have any bad implication of but if you're continuing in academia and you are all working in the same field, people will have connections. So this would be a bad mark on you. And at some point, this will come and hit you badly. So please do not do such things. And when you're called for interview, be on time. And uh, this is very important because this happens at different time zones. For example, if you call someone if you want to call someone in germany they might be giving you the time in the local times here so please make sure that what time they are specifying if they did not specify it please check with them or make sure that what time zone it is and then be there at the right time and when you want to have such interviews which is usually um, done through the internet so you should find a place with good internet connection and less disturbance and usually it'd be nice if you already have a 10 minute presentation ready because they would like to see you um, uh, see your expertise or you know previous research and so on this would also be like a, uh, you know like a test phase that if you are able to press well or if you if you know what you did and you know, anybody could be writing emails, even if your email was impressive, that this is else that they would see you you can perform well and you can answer questions and so on. And it's also important that don't go and present your entire full thesis defense in front of them because they may not have that much time. You could also ask them previously, like, can you prepare for this much time and so on? And you can already send email about this and so on. But in general, it's like 10 to 15 minutes maximum. And then if you want to show more details or, you know, if you have, if this, usually they would ask you questions and you can prepare backup slides. So then you can show your other slides when you get more questions or, you know, if, you, if they ask you for more details. And in such interviews, you should be also be transparent you should be frank so for example if you already discussed with another um, you know professor or you have been working with another professor or you already got a job just tell them about it or you tell them that you know i'm parallelly talking to two groups i would prefer you or i would prefer them and these kind of things so that they know that of course they everybody would know that you would be looking at different places but for example, if you say yes to two groups at the same time, of course, you can go only to one. This would be a, a bit of a bad mark uh, on you. As I already mentioned, they will be talking to each other. And at some point, if, if they come to know about it, uh, it would look bad. And also, they spend a lot of time on you. And they they don't fill up a position thinking that you would join and they'll all delay their, you know, um, projects and everything. So uh, in that matter, we're also important transparent and be frank. And this is also an important quality in science that you're not hiding things or you're not saying uh, fake things or uh, like ethics is very important in science. So if you, if you don't have personal ethics, people won't trust you to do science. And you should also discuss your questions, your concerns, or you can even ask about the group culture or work culture or what kind of projects would be 
you know, would be done in like any questions you have, because this interaction is very important. That would also, you know, make them feel that you're a team player, you communicate well and so on. So don't be panicked, but just be yourself, be genuine, and this is the best thing that you could in interviews. <clears throat> So next thing I want to tell you is about timeline and planning. And as I already told you, this emailing itself is, will take some time. So you may not get reply from some people. Then you want to send another email. And then once you get a reply, you have to fix this interview and so on. So the process could take about six months. It could be more. It could be less, depending on where you are and what you are and what time you're applying and everything. But you have to count at least six months. So if you want to have a, or if you are about to finish your PhD and you're looking for a postdoc, start it before your defense itself. So you're ready. And once you're ready, you can immediately join. And um, if you also want to write proposals, <clears throat> Sorry. For example, I had this Alexander von Humboldt proposal. The proposal writing would also take some time. And it's it's not, you might think that it's few pages and I could write it in a few weeks, but it's not like that. It's always very important to write, read it, rewrite it and correct it and talk with your host and you know um, rework on the proposal. So this writing time would also be like three months. And always have your passport ready, so don't run for applying for a passport after you got a job. So this is one important thing. And um, it's it's very important, or it would be a good point if you can apply for uh, an external funding. So then you don't have to wait for the group to have a project or have a position ready. So in Germany, as also in Europe, there are the main two funding that is or fellowships that are available is the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship and the Marie Curie Fellowship. So the Humboldt Fellowship is for people from. There are a lot of different kind of uh, fellowships av available at Humboldt, but for postdoctoral researchers. This is from a country coming to Germany and to work in Germany. And for this, you have to submit a proposal about, I forgot exactly, but it's like four or five pages. And this proposal, you have to write it you know, together with your host, or you have to write it after taking opinion from the host on the project and so on. And there's no deadline for the application, as so you can apply throughout the year. But they have a selection process that happens twice a year. So it depends, you know, when you submit your proposal. For example, if you submit a proposal just before the selection, you might be considered immediately. Or if you submit a proposal just after the selection is, you know, selection process started then you have to wait until the selection process. So this could take from six to 10 months to get the results. And the next one is um, uh, the Marie Curie Fellowship. And this is not for uh, just for Germany. This is whole Europe. So if you want to go to anywhere in Europe, you can apply for Marie Curie Fellowship. And Actually, Marie Curie requires an elaborate proposal. It's a bit more lengthier and also more detailed than the Humboldt. And also have mobility rule. That means if you already have lived, for example, if you are living in Germany for last six months, something, you have to check it again. Uh, if you have already been living in Germany, you will not be able to apply to Germany. So you can apply to any other country. So the thing is, you have to move from one country to another. So this is something that you have to take into account. And this year, the deadline is in 13. So if you're planning to submit a proposal, you should start working on it and do it pretty soon. And it's also, you have to 
to work together with the host. So you should already have the host opinion and the proposal should be written, you know, like together after consulting the host. <clears throat> And there are also a lot of university postdoctoral fellowships available. For example, in University of Kiel, this is Kite. And the deadline is this year, May 31st. So also, if you are interested, you could apply for such fellowships from university. So this would also be advertised in their website. OK, and most importantly, Ethics is very minimized, so it's important to give original information, important to be committed, to be truthful. So also this would be judged when you have interviews or when you write emails and so on. So if you, if they already see you that, you know, you're a copy paste person or if you give wrong information and everything, you would not be considered or you would not be taken seriously. <laughs> Sorry. And um, please do not say yes to more than one position at the same time. Because this, as I mentioned already, I want to stress this again. So this would be a really big flag and it might affect your career later. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Now we could discuss if you have any questions or, you know, I would like to talk to you all. It. Thanks, Chitra, for the talk. It was a very descriptive, elaborative talk, and thanks for that for taking time to actually talk to us. So, yeah, there are a lot of questions. I'll go one by one. So, mm -hmm. we have a question as to how to choose the right guide and when should we start applying. I think when we should start applying is already answered in your presentation. So, the question is how to choose mm -hmm. the right guide. Uh, okay, so this. Uh, would um, depend on your research field. So uh, also, if you sometimes people want to continue in the same field, or you may want to switch your research field. So this is something based on what you want to do. So, um, but you know, usually people do not do a postdoc in a completely random field, and nobody would take you. Also, if you don't have any particular on the on the field that you're working on. So there would be some, at least some overlap between what you know and what you want to do and so on. So it would be related to your field. And usually what, what would be helpful is to talk to your PhD supervisor so they could know people or they could tell you people in the field. And you can look, go through the websites and check if their research is interesting for you. And nowadays, if you search your keywords in Google, they would tell you which all groups are, you know, are there and um, are working on this field. And also, you could, um, you would know from the papers you're reading. For example, if you, for me, I was working in the field of quantum transport, and I, this is a very small field. There are not many people working in the field, so. You you see the papers that you're reading and you see the last orders and then you kind of list them, you go to their website and check and yeah, this is something how, how you could actually select people. Cool. So next, uh, Prachi, if the question is answered, then we'll move ahead. So she, uh, she has another question as to how many papers are required before we start applying for a postdoc. OK, um, there is no requirement, I would say. So this, uh, again, depends a lot. Um, people usually look at your CV, um, especially for as a first postdoc. And, and in many places, like especially in Germany, you're not expected to publish a paper after your PhD or to get your PhD. But in India, in my institute where I did my PhD, we had a obligation to at least one paper before we get our PhD. So this, but as a postdoc, it's mostly the experience. And this will depend on the field you want to do. Um, I cannot say a number at this point. But when you apply for this um, AVH, Mary 
Mary Curie usually is a bit more um, um, competitive. And usually people who do second postdoc get Mary Curie fellowship. It's not like a hard and fast rule. But that's usual because they have more publication and more expertise in writing proposal and so on. Um, yeah, there's no such requirement that you should have a publication. It would be beneficial. That's all. File, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. So does <laughs> age matters when uh, for applying anywhere around age 36 to 40 after PhD completion? Job experience has any role while getting postdoc? Uh, I would say no, as a post, no. Uh, but for a job, especially for a faculty application, or if you want to also apply for industry, they might have a age requirement. But for postdocs, as far as I know, there is no age requirement that would be looked on. And what was the second question? So does job, job, experience. job experience has any role while getting um, up? It depends on what job. So if you if you did a job based on the research that you want to do, this would be cool. But like if you did a job that is not completely, um, you know, in the research zone, then that would be considered as a career break. Then you would have to explain that thing. But uh, yeah, if you if you if you have a can you know, tell why you had a career break. And if you're still active in research, if you can say that you are still relevant and so on, then this should not be an issue. So Prachi has raised her hand, but uh, Prachi will come to you a bit later because there are a lot of questions. So we'll just go through yeah. them before. Yeah. So is it possible to get a postdoc fellowship without publication? Uh, I think yes. be better to have one i think we already answered this but um i i don't think there is any hard and fast rule about to have publication or not but it would be considered beneficial because you know you would be expected to also make publications during your postdoc help people to write their paper and so on so if you have already have a publication that would be considered beneficial but there are some fields where you know it's very difficult to publish so that this 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 is very subjective i think so then vandana has asked what is the right way to apply for postdocs i think we have talked a lot about it throughout <laughs> the presentation so i'll move forward so do we need yeah. the expertise in same field as our phd can we switch our research field do mm -hmm. they expect us to know the techniques used in the lab or do mm -hmm. they train us as well so there are four questions okay yeah, uh, so they are all connected. Uh, so uh, you won't get a training as such in a postdoc. So like if you training is a period is the PhD period. And for as a postdoc, I mean, you can switch research field, but you should have some overlap. So the I, I know also people who completely switch, but this is not a normal thing or not a usual thing. Um, do they do expect you to know some techniques at least in the lab for example um, our lab works with cryogenics uh, and we do measurements so at least it's expected to know you know you know how to handle devices or you know how to work with low temperature and so on but in my PhD, I always worked with uh, dry refrigerators. I mean, I don't know, I'm too, talking too technical, maybe. But uh, I always used dry cryostat. I was not used to liquid helium. But here, liquid helium was more important. So then I got trained in that, but small, small things. It's not like uh, you, you just get a complete training like a PhD. That's not uh, normal for a postdoc. Usually, you should have something in common and then you work or you 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 get to know this but it's not like you know you completely start a new field this is not a sure thing okay uh, so yeah i think uh, all the questions are covered for pallavi so next is please discuss your experience in applying for alexander von humboldt fellowship uh what do you mean by experience i don't know so uh, 
we had to write a proposal. So uh, this proposal I wrote in together with the, the postdoc group that I'm working in in University of Hamburg, Professor Robert Blick. So we have been exchanging emails and having things um, during that time. So I already had mentioned to him about applying for Humboldt, and then we discussed about what is the pro project. And I wrote a draft and sent it to them, and then they gave the comments, and then I, you know, corrected them and changed them, and it went a few times back and forth. And Humboldt Fellowship, it's very straightforward to apply. It's not uh, too much complicated. So there's a if you if you go to their website. Usually, how to apply and what to do, and everything is mentioned there. And you have to fill a form um, about your details and everything. I think you have to upload your CV. And you should all upload a letter from the host about, you know, you they agree that, you know, you can work in their group and everything. And the proposal itself was not that complicated. Yeah. So how much does grades play a role in a postdoc application despite having a good publication? I would say it doesn't play a role. <laughs> as far as you have passed uh, or have a minimum grade, it, it doesn't matter. So all people look at is your uh, publication, your expertise, and so on. I think people don't care about grades. So how much role does a recommendation play in a selection? If our PI does not give us a recommendation, then what is the alternative? <laughs> this is a very complicated question. So recommendation do play a big role. So as I already told you, it comes via connection. Usually, um, they would ask someone about you or uh, at some point, uh, recommendation would be important. I think also for like Humboldt Fellowship, you have to upload recommendations, or would be asked to. Uh, uh, I mean, your professors would be asked the recommendation from them. Um, I don't know if you won't get a recommendation from your PI. I, you you should talk to uh, this about uh, with your postdoctoral host. And if you have any problems with your PhD supervisor, maybe you can tell them openly. They might understand because anyway you're having an interaction with them. So you could tell them if, if you know if, if they feel that you are right and you're good and you're able to communicate well in your presentation, you see that you know you have done things and you know what you have done and everything. And then you just tell openly that. If you had a problem with your supervisor and it's not possible to get a recommendation, and there are good people everywhere, so somebody will understand. So, how to know if the future lab I'll be joining is toxic or not? <sighs> also, a complicated question. So, uh, it would always be helpful to talk to someone in the group. So, um, for example, the previous members of the group or the current members of the group whom you think, you know, probably from the same country or from India or who you know already, someone you, you know is working in the group and so on. Try to contact them and ask them about the work culture. And you would understand a little bit already when you're talking to the professors. This is why it's important to make conversations. So you talk to them, you tell them your concern. You try to, you know, have some conversation with them. This is some way you could get to know if they are good or if they are toxic. And at the end of the day, at some point, you may not be able to judge. And you, your judgment might go wrong. And people might not seem um, as, you know, they are when, when you start working. So. If you if you join and if after a few months you see that it's not working out, you should just leave and then find a right place for you. OK, so ideally, when can we start preparing for a particular fellowship application before a year? A year would be a safe thing to do. Yeah, at least six months, at least. 
So in order to apply for fellowships, how to contact host institute? Do we have to first get a uh, postdoc position and then apply for fellowships like Madam Puri fellowship? Uh, you do both ways. So Mar Madam Curie, uh, no. So you already have this mobility rule for Madam Curie or Mary Curie where you cannot uh, if you if you're already working in a group and then you want to continue in the same group this is not possible so you have to switch country so uh, for Mary Curie, this is a problem i mean there is some month limit that they are saying so if you're within that month then it's probably okay but this is something that you need to check um but for uh humboldt or uh yeah, you could. You, oh, I think also for Humboldt, there is a mobility rule. I forgot this, need to check again. Um, but you, it is possible to already join a group and then apply if, if you're within that time. But usually, the host would also. So, what happened in my case was I told them that I'm interested to apply for Humboldt and Curie. So, I wrote both and I got Humboldt. But before I got Humboldt, I already got a position in the group. So they had changed something because, you know, they wanted me in the group because I had a different expertise that they were looking for uh, and some common um, expertise as well. So they wanted my expertise. So they, they gave me a position by organizing some funding. But I already applied for the Humboldt position uh, or Humboldt fellowship. And I got the fellowship after joining the group. But I already applied for it. And I switched. Yeah. So that's how it was in my case. It's possible to apply uh, after going there, but you have to consider the time limit that is mentioned in their website. Just sending a CV is OK, or do we need some cover letter as well? Yeah, so the cover letter is basically the email. So we discussed about uh, how to write an email. I also showed you an example. Email. So don't just send a CV with a plain, uh, you know, without subject or without a text. So that would not be considered good. But the cover letter is basically the, the email as such. So this is with regards to AVH and Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowships. While initially emailing the host PI, should we state a fellowship proposal idea to the PI or should we discuss about it only if invited for an interview by the PI? um yeah well i would say you don't have to say the proposal idea so the idea usually you come up together it's 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 not that you know you just say your idea and so on um to have an idea already you could mention it briefly but it would be good if you discuss it i mean why do you want to share your idea if they have no interest in you they would they might just take your idea and then they were they might write the proposal themselves right so it's not a good idea to just share or if you if you have a very interesting idea of research i would say don't share it just like that have an interview and talk about it that would be a good way to do so subramanian has said thanks a lot for your informative talk how much importance is given for conferences attended or presented during phd when applying for a postdoc um well at least from my experience or from um how my uh, postdoc supervisor or pi looks at the application we don't see them giving importance to this field but if in your cv like you had uh, mentioned that you gave a lot of presentations or if you had post a prize and so on that that's a plus point because they know that you can present or you can communicate and so it's a plus point but i don't think that if you don't have any experience of conference you would be rejected i don't think so so how much does it matter if there is a break between phd and postdoc um if you have a genuine reason for example um like if especially for women career break is um, natural thing so uh, those cases are usually considered and even for these proposals they would give an extra year or so for um, 
for women, uh, especially due to career break in, in their in their life. But uh, if you have a long break and and if you can, so if you're just applying after a break, this might be a bad thing because that might mean that you are not not exposed to the current research field and, and things like that. But if you had a career break long back, then, then that might not be a big issue. So do we get publications from industrial postdocs? Is there any is there any website for checking that? Oh, um, I don't have any personal experience about industrial postdoc. But I think um, you can have publication uh, from industrial postdoc. I think Pyle can maybe tell about it more in detail, I guess. No, industrial postdoc is not common in India. So. OK. <laughs> yeah. OK, so. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think. Publication is possible depending on the industry, but uh, I, I don't have a lot. Of... OK, so we are done with the questions that are mentioned in the chat. So Prachi and Pallavi have raised their hands. If Prachi, you could go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you, Chitra, ma'am, for giving so much you information. Can call me Chitra, please. <laughs> so I had this, like in your slide, you mentioned it is less productivity somewhere in the cons mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, uh, understanding like after phd our productivity will increase maybe because now we understand things in a better way so in postdoc uh, why the pr productivity decreases and my second question um, is like if i know i am going to take uh, maybe six mm -hmm. months or seven months to finish my phd so mm -hmm. should I write, uh, start writing to the professors prior to it, or if there is less time gap, then I should write? Um, so um, I think right now, if you if you will depend in, in like six months, this would be the right time to start doing it. But uh, it would also be good if you could discuss this with your PA supervisor that you know he could tell or he or she could tell you that uh, this is this would be the right time or you would be actually finished because they know this much better than you might anticipate so this might go a bit more or less so you could talk to them um but i i would say if uh, six if it's like in six months time that you would be finishing your phd you should start thinking about applying you should already start um uh, you know, like choosing people system and uh, filtering out and so on. So this would be the right time to start the process. And about productivity, this is again a subjective thing. So I'm, I, I told you some of the cons might go into the pros and back and forth. But um, what I meant was, uh, this is also, so the work culture in India is very different. At least this was my experience. So whenever uh, we work in the group in India, and if we if we had to do something, someone would was always available. Especially my uh, supervisor was always available, and everything was working much more faster. Uh, but th there are also cons too because a lot of equipments could be broke down, and if you want to fix it, you need to get some parts from abroad to come there. This might take time and a lot of things. Here, that kind of things are very easy. Uh, but what I meant was, um, like, you may not have people available. For example, if your uh, supervisor is gone for vacation and you're writing a paper and you're expecting a, a correction or feedback for that him or her, this um, might, you have to wait until they can come back from the vacation. So this is what I meant uh, by productivity. So because uh, the work-life balance here is also very important uh, sorry okay uh, ma'am uh, one more thing like you said paper is not required but if there is no paper mm -hmm. then how we are going to tell like uh, but whatever we are saying is genuine or not or uh, we know we have that certain kind of skill without having those papers uh yeah so this happens when you have a decision so um usually you would have an interview or you would be asked to do a short presentation 
and would ask you questions based on that. So if, if you can do a good job there, and if you can convince them that uh, you know what you're doing and you, you know you you know the science and if when you're asked questions you're able to reply and these kind of things will prove that you know you are eligible okay thank you thank you so much you're welcome so pallavi has raised her hand if pallavi if you can go ahead and ask your question uh hi chitra uh, thank you Hi, for the Hi, insightful talk. Uh, I have a question related to recommendation itself. Like, uh, is mm -hmm. it they ask for recommendation before the interview or they ask for recommendation after the interview? And secondly, if I don't give recommendation of my PI or barring my PI, if I give recommendation of any other faculty, would that work? Uh, okay, so um, it, it depends. Uh, sometimes they might ask for interview, sometimes they might ask after. So this depends from place to place. Um, and sometimes they might not even ask for recommendation. This might come only when you want to apply for fellowships and, and things like that. But most, most people would like to ask for a recommendation from your PhD supervisor. Because they are the people who really know uh, what you have done and your capabilities are and what you know you could uh, what your potentials are and how um, um, effective you could work and so on so usually this is the most important recommendation even throughout your life i would say so from your phd supervisor is, is very important and but if for some reason you're not able to get it uh, as I mentioned before, you could communicate this with your postdoc uh, advisor or your, you know, uh, your potential postdoc advisor. You tell them that you know you because for this and this reason it's not possible for me. This is the option. But if you can give from another people, of course they might then ask you why are you not giving from your PhD supervisor, and then you can explain. Pallavi, I hope that answers your question. Are yeah, there any yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chitra. So are there any mm -hmm. more questions? People can unmute themselves and ask questions if they want to. OK, so if there are no more questions, then we will conclude the session. Thank you, Chitra. OK. Okay, and thanks a lot, Pail. Rahul is saying something. Excuse me. If you want to go ahead, okay. Rahul, just answer, uh, you can un unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, sure. Okay. Okay, there are more hands coming up now. Uh, okay, okay, Rajesh, go ahead. Rajesh, you raised your hands. Can you just go ahead? Huh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So how is the teaching load uh, in Germany uh, speaks for a postdoc? Like, uh, so we have to do the independent research and also research along with the research group, right? So how does the teaching load will affect on each of it? That's the thing you want to do. Oh, OK. That's a good question, actually. So I, I currently work in the group of um, Professor Rosnagel in where I got a position which is a university postdoc. So this postdoc position is available not from any funding or not for any particular project. So where this comes together with teaching duties. So this postdoc is defined like a position with teaching duties include. So I have to go there and teach. Um, so this uh, so this usually is mentioned in the contract, but not most positions are not like that. Most posi positions come from some proposals that PIs write, and uh, this usually will not have any teaching um, um, tied to it. So you just have to do your research, and if there are any requirements for for teachers, sometimes you know some people might not be available, and there might be courses that are 
open for teaching and they might ask people like especially during covid uh, they had to do everything online or when they had this number restriction in one one room especially for practical courses they split people into many groups so then they wanted more teachers so then that time i was working in university of hamburg i was with alexander von humboldt fellowship i did that to but they asked and then i chose it because you know i was interested in it so usually it does not come with teaching but some position will come with teaching and then you have to teach and this depends varies so this will be mentioned in your contract and this you should you should ask the pi for um, you know going into the position so you can ask them about this if you will have to teach or if there is any Uh, want to teach you can also ask them if there is any possibility to do so and so on also another thing i would like to add to chitra that if you want to teach if you want to become a professor and have an independent group in germany then it is important for you to have teaching experience it doesn't matter mm-hmm. if it is mentioned in your contract or not but if you want to teach and want to be settle in uh, germany as a professor or have an independent group you need to go through that teaching experience for several years before you can actually become independent mm-hmm. okay yes. so thanks uh, a lot thanks a lot yeah. yeah uh then there is a question i am a theoretical physicist and how much does funding play a role in theory as opposed to experimental physics uh-huh so um in in theory funding is usually for purpose uh they don't uh, as far as i know um they don't really ask for a lot of funding for equipments as much as we recommend this do they might ask for computational equipments or for computers and and so on and so forth but usually it's for the people so or for the workforce so um so for humboldt fellowship and so on if you if you're talking about them it's a funding for your own um, you know it's it's funding for equipment and so on it's just funding for you so it's basically a, a fellowship i don't know if that was your question um yeah okay so are there any more questions does anyone want to ask any question or you can type it you can unmute yourself and ask questions teaching wala teaching wala post of germany mein hai ha wo baat hai usko kya pata hai hello pallavi okay so there are uh, more more okay so prachi you can go ahead uh, what is the living cost means in germany means uh ha huh. does uh, scholarship which we are getting is it sufficient like if you are going with the family oh with the family okay um so if you have salary only for uh, okay so one more thing uh, good that you ask so in germany um, the the salary is usually called uh, levels so for postdoc either it's e13 or e14 so uh, and there will be percentage so um my in so th- there will be like 50% position 75% position or 100% position so that means you are you will paid for 50%, 50% of your working hours so normally 40 hours a week a, a week is the normal working hour of a person you are not allowed to work more than that and that is the maximum pay that you can get for 40 hours if you get the 50% position that's only half the money or only for 20 hours a week and if you get 75% for 75% of the time so you have to also talk to uh, your pi about this and what kind of position you will get so your salary would depend on uh, the type of position or the time that you are allowed of course if you want to do if you want to publish a lot of papers if you want to be a uh, productive you might work for all 40 hours or even more than that but you would be only paid for if if it's a 75% position you would be only paid for that much so this is something you have to talk to them and 
um, you know, understand already. And uh, about the um, about the living expense, it would depend. So if you are going with a family, you cannot live in a V gay, what is called a flat sharing or a home sharing. Uh, that would be a lesser expensive option. But if you are, if you want to live in an independent house, depending on the size of the house, depending on the area and everything, your rent might might vary. And uh, recently, everything has increased. Every expense has increased for the Ukraine war. Um, so, as a family, I would say your rent might. It, it also depends on the city you're living in. It could go up to thousand euros, or even more, depending on the size of the flat or size of the house and the city you live in. Uh, you could consider as a family, I'm telling, so then it could go to like 1,000 euros. And then for living, it depends if you cook on your own or if you want to eat food from outside. Uh, if you want to just cook on your own and eat, I would say probably 100 euros would be sufficient. So the rest would be for you. And uh, usually in Germany, children will get um, a lot of benefits. For example, schooling is free, education for children is free. So those kind of things uh, would not, I guess, cost you a lot of money. But I don't have an experience in this to say more. Thank you. Uh, Shija, do you want to ask the question? Because you have raised your hand. I think she already asked it in the chat. Is that the same question? Okay, so I, she, uh, I think she, yeah. So I'm a mother of one year old. I'm thinking to apply for a postdoc abroad. Would you be able to give some inputs on work life balance? Yeah, so in Germany, as a rule, you're not supposed to work for more than 40 hours a week. Uh, they also will sometimes force you to go on vacations as well. So um, uh, in science, it's not very, very strict, but typically you are not supposed to work more than 40 hours. And all your colleagues, who, especially those who are German, uh, would, if they come at 8 in the morning, they would be out already by uh, 4.30 or 5. And rest of the time is yourself. So you can plan accordingly. So nobody will force you to work for more than that. And nobody can force you to work more than that. Does that answer your question, Shrija? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if our mic is working or not. So I'll just go ahead. Yeah. And yeah. Yes, yeah. I, she answered, answered it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coordinating this. Mm -hmm. So speaking on the basis, basis of postdoctoral salary, which countries are preferred? Um, um, I, I don't have much experience, to be honest. Though, but Germany actually pays a pretty good, uh, good salary. In general, in science, the pay is not the rate. If you go for um, some industry or even some um, data science jobs they even in germany you might get paid much much well so science is not the well paid uh, job in any country but still comparatively in germany the pay is pretty good usually the postdoc positions are at least 75 percent of e13 so you have to make sure that you get that don't get trapped for something low. And what are the industries? So this is the last question we will take because it's already an hour. So what are the industry job opportunities after postdoc from Germany or EU, specifically in the field of data science, AI, HPC? Huh. Uh, I think data science, uh, I think, has a lot of opportunities these days. And also AI. I don't know what is HPC. Um, uh, for AI and data science, nowadays it's a, it's a blooming field, so there are a lot of opportunities. And depending on on the time, nowadays the market is a bit dull, but still, if, especially if you have a PhD, you're getting good jobs. And as postdoc experience, 
frankly i do not have a, like a no, feeling for it actually i know many people who have phd uh, um, uh, in science get very good uh, data science jobs but i i, I don't know to be honest okay so uh, we we will conclude the session because now the questions keep coming so if you have any more <laughs> questions you can email it to phdsofindia@gmail.com and uh, i'll forward it to chitra and she can answer back back with the mm -hmm. relevant questions or queries that you have the this session has been recorded and it is available on our YouTube channel. So if you have not been able to attend the entire session or you came in late, you can always go to the uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel and you can access the interview, uh, the webinar here. So yeah, I think so. Thank you, Chitra, for taking so much time and answering all the questions and doing this for PhDs of India. It's Thanks a lot, Pyle, for, yeah. for having me. Yeah. Okay. It was very happy to interact with people. So yeah. Cool. Great. So thank you, everyone. And we are going to now conclude the session. Yeah.